Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me here. It's been a long time since I've been in Edinburgh, and it's, it's great to come here. And thank you all for coming along and listening. This is a talk about what the proof is. At least I hope that's what the talk's about. I'm going to try to get across some of the ideas I've been having about theories of truth. A theory of truth, there can be lots of things that will go under the title of a theory of truth. So I'm interested in quite a specific way of looking at the question of what truth is. I'm interested in the property of truth, the property that propositions or sayings or statements or contents have when they're true. So what is that property? What is the nature or essence or being of that property? Contrast that with theories that tell us what our concept of truth is, how we talk about truth, why we have a concept or a word of truth, what kind of use truth is, how truth relates to belief. I'm not interested so much in that kind of stuff. I'm interested really in the metaphysics of truth. So this talk, in some ways, has a very simple idea to put across. But it's an idea that's quite difficult to defend. And it's an idea that developing it in a certain way breeds lots of other interesting ideas. So what I'm hoping to do in this talk is a whole bunch of things. I'm hoping to get across what the view is, why I think it's interesting, some of the ways in which I think it could be argued for, and then some of the interesting consequences it's going to have. So because there's kind of a whole bunch of stuff there, I'm not going to go into any one of these aspects in a huge amount of detail. I'm going to give you a fairly impressionistic view of some of these arguments, some of these components that make the whole view add up to something interesting. So what I'm hoping you do is, uh, in the question time after, say to me, look Mark, you're going to need to think a little bit more about this, or how do those two parts of the talk go together, or, um, or whatever. So let me tell you what I think the view is, what I think the property of truth is. It's the property of being made true by something in the world. Okay? So those of you who know traditional theories of truth, we're pretty much talking about the traditional correspondence <coughs> theory of truth. Okay, to be true is for a proposition or a statement or a thought to correspond to an appropriate kind of thing in the world. Or for those of you familiar with the modern truth making way of looking at things, to be true is the property of having a truth maker. So if we've got a theory of truth making up and running, we understand what that relationship is between something in the world, a truth maker, and a truth proposition. Then the property of truth is just the existential generalization of that on the world. When there is this thing standing in the truth making relation to a proposition, when there is something like that, then the proposition is true. And the property that expresses that existential generalization, that's the property of truth. So in some sense, nothing new or fancy going on there at all. Except, if you look at the way people who go in for truth making describe their theory, their theory of truth making, very few philosophers think of it as a theory of truth. So Armstrong, for instance, the kind of, one of the modern proponents of the theory of truth making says, it's not a theory of truth, it's not a theory of what truth is. It tells you how a truth gets to be true, but it doesn't tell you what it is for it to be true. It doesn't tell you what truth is. And I think the reason people have said that, they've distanced truth making as a theory from truth as a theory, is because truth making has truth in it. So they, they say something like this, well, you can't explain what truth making is unless you know what truth is. So truth is part of truth making conceptually. You can't explain truth making without truth. So we sure can't explain truth in terms of truth making. 
I think that's a confusion between our conceptual access to a concept, to a topic, to an idea, and the kind of metaphysical direction of things. Metaphysically, my story is going to be, there is this relationship out there between things in the world and propositions. Now, to kind of get a conceptual hold on that relation, we might need to talk in terms of things being true and false. But uh, there is this relation out there, but once we've understood that relation, then we understand what truth is. <clears throat> Because I'm not so much interested in our concept of truth, I'm not really primarily interested in defining up, giving necessary and sufficient conditions for truth. So by the same token, I'm not interested in defining up, giving necessary and sufficient conditions for truth making. Okay? Truth making isn't a concept where I will say, here's my set of necessary and sufficient conditions. To be a truth maker for P is for blah, blah, blah. I'm not so much interested in doing that. I'm interested in talking about the metaphysics of this relation. Not defining it, but looking at what kind of relationship it is. That's all my way of outlining the view of truth that I have. What I want to do now is think about what I think of as the, the main competitor, competitor to this view of truth. I've got my, this theory of truth as a heavy-duty metaphysical theory. Truth consists in a proposition standing in an appropriate relationship to existing things in the world. It's a heavy-duty metaphysical substantial theory of truth. Contrast that with the popular, I guess, the dominant modern theory of truth, which is a deflationist theory. It says, Really, there's no property of truth. Or if there is a property of truth, it's just a lightweight, logical or conceptual property. Really, all we need to know about truth is the following. Sunny today, if and only. The proposition that it's sunny today is true, if and only if it's sunny today. In general, proposition A is true, if and only if A. Once we've got the hang of that kind of biconditional relationship, that's all there is to truth. Then we can do some fancy things like generalise and say everything Ryan told me earlier is true. We could do that kind of like logical construction. But really, the basis of all we need to know about truth is given by the biconditional A is true if only if A. That's broadly the deflationist view of truth. There's nothing metaphysically heavy duty to the concept of truth, and there sure isn't any de-metaphysical truth-making relationship coming into the property of what truth is. That's the deflationist view. So one reason you would be dissatisfied with my view of truth is you're a deflationist. Here's another angle you could take to use to object to my view. Suppose you're a novelist. Suppose you don't believe in things like properties. If you don't believe in them, you're certainly not going to believe in things like states of affairs. States of affairs being the things in the world, the world-shaped bits that correspond to truths. If you don't believe in those kind of entities, it's going to be very hard for you to find things in the world, the facts, that correspond to truths. I'm not going to talk so much about normalism here. I'm just mentioning it to set it aside. I'm going to look uh, for a little bit about the deflationist view and why I think there's a problem with it. In seeing that there's a problem with deflationism, that's going to provide some motivation for going into a more heavy-duty notion of truth. So I've said what I think the deflationist theory is. Something like Paul Horrocks says, the property of truth or the concept of truth is implicitly defined by taking all of the T sentences, the biconditionals, A is true if and only if A, together. I think there's two main problems with that. One, it's the fairly obvious problem that's been discussed an awful lot. Paradoxes, truth theoretic paradoxes, things like the liar. Okay? There is a content, there, there, there is most certainly a sentence this sentence is not true, or this sentence is false. That's going to be put into those T-schemes. If we run that with standard logic, we're going to get contradictions. 
if we run it with non-standard logic such that we don't get contradictions or at least we don't get the bad kind of contradictions that we don't want. Turns out the logic has to be so incredibly weak that we can't do any of the reasoning we want to be able to do. Okay, so line of sentences together with the T scheme, bad. What do deflationists say about that? Well, Horwich says, ah, oh, yeah, we were wrong to say that truth is implicitly defined by all the T sentences. It's just implicitly defined by all the ones that are okay. So, kind of ignore the bad ones, keep the ones we've got left. That is what defines our theory of truth. But the problem is you can't say which are the good ones and the bad ones. It's not just those involving the line of sentence that constitute the bad ones from the deflationist point of view. We can have sentences which aren't in themselves line of sentences, sentences which say, you know, one sentence says that sentence over there is not true, and another sentence which says that one over there is true. So each one on its own poses no liar like problem, but you put them together and you get these kind of liar circles. We can have sentences uh, arranged in a kind of order where each one says all the sentences further on in the order are not true. And then you don't get any cycles of truth-like paradox, but you still get truth-like paradox. So what we've found from the history of trying to solve the line paradox is it's really hard. It's really hard to lay down the conditions, conditions that say, exclude those kind of T sentences and your theory is going to be okay. It's really hard to do. The deflationist has to come up with some kind of criteria and the history of trying to solve the problem strongly suggests that there is no nice, neat criteria we can give. Horwich doesn't give any criteria. He just says, ah, oh, I hope there's something we can say. I'm not sure what it is. So he's got his fingers crossed but it will work out in the end. I don't think that's good enough for a theory of truth. So anyway, that is one problem with deflationism. I'm not really going into that in much detail, I'm just going to leave it there. We could talk about it more later. There's really nothing new there. I'm going to talk about another problem with deflationism, which is something that I don't think deflationists have thought about in very much detail. So let's have a think. Deflationists need to account for every truth. Not every truth is expressible in a sentence. We don't have a sentence for everything that's true. So, deflationists shouldn't express their theory using sentences. They need to express their theory, or they need their theory to consist in Something that runs beyond sentences. They need to express their theory, or they need to say their theory consists in propositions expressing by conditional equivalences. And that applies both to the P is true part of the equivalence as well as the P part of the equivalence. Okay? So a deflationist theory will consist in propositions of the form. Proposition on the left. Proposition P is true. On the right, proposition P. That proposition has two instances of proposition P. Or rather, that's not quite right. If you have a look at how I've got it written down on the handout, just under point three, second bullet point down, proposition A is true if and only if A. Notice that on the left-hand side, a occurs in the proposition within angle brackets, and on the right it occurs just as an A. What's going on here is kind of we're using the angle brackets to express the proposition that, just like a philosopher would use quote marks to express the sentence that. Difference between use and mention. We're doing the same sort of thing on the propositional level. So angle bracket something means propositional constituent corresponding to da da da. So the A on the left of that by conditional proposition is not the proposition of A. It's something like a propositional term denoting the proposition A. Just like if we quote A, we don't mean sentence A, we mean a name for sentence A. Deflationists need 
a proposition like that for every proposition A. So proposition quote A must be a function of proposition A. Functions are extensional. Give a function one input, you get one output. But lots of theories of propositions, what the constituents of propositions are, will give you the wrong results there. So for Frigians, thinking about propositions, will tell you the constituents of a proposition aren't regular objects, they're Frigian senses, they're modes of presentation of an object. And in general, according to Frigians, there isn't a one-one correspondence, there isn't a function from objects to propositional constituents. You might think about me in lots of different ways. I don't really want to think about what they are right now. But there will be lots of different modes of presentation you might have for me. They will get into propositions that people will think about a particular object. There won't be a function from an object to propositional constituents denoting that object. That conflicts with what we just said about deflationist propositions. Deflationists need there to be this function from propositions to propositional constituents denoting propositions. By the way, I wish I had a more intuitive, uh, less technical way of getting at this problem, but I haven't found it yet. What I think the upshot of this is, is propositions for deflationists must be something like Russellian propositions. There must be a one-one correspondence between the things the propositions are about on the one hand and the things that go into propositions denoting those things. A Russellian just says, well, they're the same thing. There's a one-one correspondence between these things because they're identical. A Russellian tells you that what goes into the proposition that Mark is talking right now is Mark and the property of talking. So, there's a strong push towards the conclusion that deflationists must express their theory in terms of Russellian propositions containing the very things that they're about. So, conclusion number one, deflationists are committed to properties and relations as well as particulars. So already there we've started on this road towards, well hang on, their theory isn't so metaphysically deflationist after all, they're committed to some heavy duty stuff. But maybe they might be okay with that. So interim conclusion, even deflationists are committed in their theory of truth to some heavy duty metaphysical stuff. But here's where it starts to bite. I said, and the deflation says, her theory of truth is all propositions, or if you like, the set of propositions of a certain form. Their theory of truth is a set of propositions. Call it T. Now that theory, T, that set of propositions, has some properties, right? It's a set, it contains propositions, it's being thought about by Paul Horikshalar. So, there are propositions of the form, T is a set, if and only if, sorry, no. T is a set, proposition is true, if and only if T is a set. Those kind of propositions will be part of the deflationist theory of truth, that is T. So what's going on here? We've got propositions, part of which is T, and that proposition, that whole thing, it's part of T. So T is a part of a proposition that's a part of T. That seems slightly suspect to me. Now, I might be playing fast and loose with the concept of part here. Because the way in which something gets to be part of a set is through membership. And the way in which something gets to be part of a proposition is, who knows? It might be set membership, it might be partnerhood, it might be something weird. So I think the way to express this problem is not so much through partnerhood, but through identity determination. What do I mean by that? Well, either things are metaphysically primitive, their identity is just, there it is on the table, nothing to say about it, or they have their identity determined by other stuff. Case in hand, a set. 
the set containing all of us in the room, has its identity determined purely by all of us together. That's clear case. Okay. But I think we can, if we have a theory of propositions, part of what we would have is a theory of what determines the identity of that proposition. And nearly every theory of propositions that we have will tell you that the identity of the proposition is determined by its constituents. We know about the identity of sets. It's determined by its members. Here's a claim that I think is true. Identity determination, even partial identity determination, by partial identity determination, I mean something like this. I alone don't determine the identity of the set of all of us, but I do partly determine the identity of the set of all of us. Claim identity determination, even partial identity determination, can't be cyclic. If A contributes to determining the identity of B, then B can't contribute to determining the identity of A. But we've got a case here, deflationism, where we have these cycles of partial identity determination. Claim, I think that's bad for deflationists. So, I'm eyeing the clock and thinking to myself, I went through that pretty quickly, but I want to leave it there because I don't want to spend the whole time talking about why some other theory isn't so good. I want to tell you something positive about why I think it's a good theory. So I'm going to move on now. I'm going to skip over the page and talk about the truth now. I said at the beginning, I want to give you a theory of truth, what the property of truth is <coughs> in terms of the existence of a truth maker. That's a difficult theory to defend because not only do you have to convince people there is such a thing as truth making, not only do you have to come up with a story about what truth makers are and what the truth making relation is, you also have to convince people that every truth has a truth maker. Right? If some truths don't have a truth maker, then the property of truth can't consist in the existentially quantified something makes this thing true. So I've got to come up with an argument to say that every truth has a truth maker. And that has looked really hard. Loads of people have tried it, they've come up with all kinds of crazy ideas, and they've all got massive problems. I mean, their theories have got massive problems, they've got problems, maybe they've got anything. My approach is not going to be, I'm going to give you some entities which look like they may be true a certain class of truths. I'm going to try and give you a general argument for the conclusion that if a certain class of truths have truth makers, then so does another class. I'm going to start off with truths that I think it's obvious that they have truth makers and try and push you into a class of truths where it's obvious they don't have truth makers. But I'm just going to try and convince you that the second class, in fact, do have truth makers. So the class of truths that I think have truth makers are um, uh, truths about existence. You know, it's true that I exist. It's pretty obvious that that has a truth maker. Me. Because the truth condition we give to existentially quantified sentences is they've got a witness. There is a thing in the world that makes them true. I think it's also pretty plausible that simple predications have truth makers. So the statement that I'm pacing right now, well, there's a state of affairs corresponding to that. What I'm doing right now, state of affairs, that thing in the world, the state of affairs of my pacing, makes true the proposition that I'm pacing. So there's a bunch of truths where it's pretty plausible that they have truth makers. The problematic class of truths are the negative truths, things like negative existentials. There's no such thing as hobbits. That kind of thing. What in the world would make that true? Well, some people have tried to give a theory of truth making that says, look, there are these truths that have truth, truth makers, and then there are the other class of truth that don't have truth makers. Okay? So for the second class of truth, the truth consists in 
the absence of a truth maker for their negation. So what it is that makes it true that there are no hobbits is not something in the world, but rather the lack of a truth maker for the corresponding proposition. There are hobbits. So you take the negation, there are hobbits. You go, well, there's nothing that makes that true. So because there's no truth maker for, there are hobbits. It's true that there are no hobbits. That's what I'm going to call the non-maximalist theory of truth making. Non-maximalist because it doesn't say that every truth has a truth maker. Just some of them do. Why does that theory go wrong? Well, it'll work if every proposition falls into one of the two camps. The ones that do have a truth maker, or the ones where you work out whether it's true or false based on the absence of a truth maker for its negation. Two camps, if everything falls into one camp or the other nice and neatly, it works. But not every proposition falls into one of those two camps. Take the disjunction. Marx, Pacey, or there are no hobbits. <coughs> Is that the kind of proposition that falls into the first camp? Needs a truth maker to be true? No. It could be true even if I'm not Pacey, because there's still no hobbits. Is it the kind of proposition that's true just in case it's negation of lacks truth maker? Well, no, because I can make it true by pacing. Doesn't fall neatly into either case. So what the non-maximalist truth maker guy should say is that there's a third class of proposition, derivative propositions. The obvious thing to say about this junction is not to put it in one of these two camps, but to say its truth is inherited from the truth of its disjuncts, right? So if you want to work out how the truth-making story for either A or B goes, you first look at the truth-making story for A, then you work out the truth-making story for B, and then you just say, oh, it's one or the other. That's how this junction is going to work. That would be, either A or B, would be a derivative truth. So, now the non-maximalist theory of truth-making has three classes of proposition. The ones that require truth-makers, the negative ones, that is the ones whose truth is worked out in terms of the absence of truth-makers for some other proposition, and the third class, the derivative ones. I still think this theory won't work. Here's why. Take this proposition. Max knows there are no Daleks. We've got to work out what kind of proposition that is by the non-maximalist lines. Is it the positive kind with the truth maker? Is it the negative kind? Or is it the derivative kind? Well, it better not be the positive kind. If it's the positive kind, then it has a truth maker if true. But if it's got a truth maker, then that truth maker will be something that guarantees that Max knows there are no hobbits. Sorry, hobbits, Daleks. I'm getting confused. Daleks on the, on the hand up. The truth maker will guarantee that Max knows there are no Daleks. But if Max knows there are no Daleks, then there's no Daleks. Knowledge is factive. So the truth maker will be some entity in the world that guarantees that there are no Daleks. Well, that's just the kind of entity that the non-maximalists wanted to avoid. Weirdo absences that somehow guarantee such and such will exist. So, that proposition, Max knows there are no Daleks, would better not be positive. But it better not be negative either. Why? If it's negative, then it's the kind of proposition that is true by its negation, having no truth maker. But it's just the wrong kind of proposition to do that, because suppose Max doesn't even believe that there are no Daleks. Suppose Max doesn't even exist. Well, then we've got a case of making that thing false, not by the existence of a truth maker, but something like an absence or a lack. It's just the wrong kind of proposition to be a negative problem. So the third case, is it a derivative proposition? That is, does the truth of Max knows that there are no Daleks depend on other, simpler propositions? 
Well, maybe it does, but I'm going to say, if you think that, tell me the story of how it derives. What are the propositions on which the truth of Max knows there are no propositions depends? Bet you can't do it. Why is that? Because if you could tell me what those propositions were, you'd have a nice little theory of what knowledge is in terms of more simple concepts. Now, you might have one of those tucked up your sleeve. If you do, go out and publish it. Because people have been trying to work out what knowledge is, trying to give a reductive definition of knowledge for absolutely yards, and it hasn't worked out good. It looks like we can't treat knowledge as a conceptually derivative concept. It's really hard to give a bunch of conditions for what knowledge is. We can't do that. Seems to me a tough claim to say there must be propositions out there on which the truth of Max knows that blah 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 depends. So that's my argument for saying that oh, this, this non-maximalist theory looks in bad shape. I think their best option is probably to say this thing does have a truth maker. There is a truth maker out there for Max knows that there are no Daleks. There is an entity in the world that makes it true. It's an ent entity that guarantees that there are no Daleks. Well, then I just say thanks very much. Because I'm going to take that entity and say, because it guarantees that there are no Daleks, it's a truth maker for the proposition there are no Daleks. That's just the kind of proposition that's not meant to have a truth maker. So I'll say, thank you very much. You've just given me a truth maker for the tricky case. That's my reason for thinking that there are going to be truth makers for all propositions. It's not a proof. It's an argument that starts off with the hard case and says, whatever you say about it, if you think that other propositions have truth makers, looks like we're going to have truth makers for this one as well. That's an argument for believing in truth maker maximalism, the thesis that all truths have a truth maker. It doesn't tell you anything about what those truth makers are. We're completely in the dark, metaphysically, about what those truths are, well, what those truth makers are. So, still, if I'm trying to convince you that all truths have a truth maker and the truth consists in having a truth maker, I'm going to have to tell you a metaphysical story about what those kind of entities are. The kind of entities that make it true that, for instance, there are no Daleks. Well, to cut a long story short, I think that they're negative facts. I think negative facts are in good metaphysical standing. I'm more or less alone in that. I mean, Russell, at some point, seemed to think that there was such a thing as negative facts. Not many other people do. Why do I think that there are negative facts? Apart from the fact that it just kind of fits in nicely with my theory of truth. Well, here's some reasons. <coughs> I'm quite a big donut eater. And, you know, ring donuts, you, they wouldn't be the things they are unless they lacked donuts. <coughs> The middle. You have to be able to stick your hand right through the middle and get thin air, otherwise it's not a ring donut. So part of what makes a ring donut a donut is that it has donut dough around the outside and it lacks it in the middle. There is this fact about donuts that in the middle there is no donut dough. That fact enters into the constitution of what donuts are. So I kind of see that as a negative fact. The fact that there is no donut dough here enters into the makeup that material object. You can see it. You can see the lack of donut dough. When you're playing cricket, if you hit a good shot, you can see that there's a gap over there. I don't think that's an inference from, oh look, there's a guy there, there's a guy there, there's a guy there. Do some thinking, oh, there's no guy there. You look and you immediately see, you perceive the absence of a fielder over there and you hit the ball there. I think the best metaphysical explanation of these kind of things is there are such things as negative facts or absences in the world. I mean, perception is a causal relationship, and its remarks are you as an agent and 
something in the world than perceiving an absence. I kind of speak strongly in favour of there being absences qua things. And I think absences qua things are best explained in terms of the negative fact that there ain't one of those there. Here's another thing, a much more theoretical reason for thinking negative facts are in good standing. Or rather, it's a, it's a way of me dancing around the issue of, aren't you going to incur massive ontological costs by believing in these things? Here's the kind of dialectic I'm interested in going in for. Suppose we're all on the same page in believing in regular everyday states of affairs, like the state of affairs that I'm facing right now. Suppose we believe in such states of affairs. Question, what are they? What's our best theory of states of affairs? My claim's going to be, whatever that theory is, whatever theory you're going to offer me, I can give you a really similar theory for negative states of affairs that doesn't really incur much extra cost. Suppose you tell me, suppose you've read your Armstrong, and you tell me that the state of affairs of me pacing up and down consists in the property of pacing, it consists in me, and it consists in this weird way of composing the two things together non muriologically That means we're not just taking those two things as a plurality. It's not the whole with those things as parts. It's some weird metaphysical primitive way of combining things. Okay. Well, suppose that theory is in good standing. Just suppose. What have we got? Particulars, properties, and this weird, inexplicable metaphysical primitive that stuck together with the other stuff gives us positive states of affairs. Suppose that's all good and hunky dory. Well, if you're allowed to have this weird metaphysical primitive that gives us positive states of affairs, Let's just say it comes in two flavours. There's the weird metaphysical primitive that puts property in particular together to give us positive states of affairs. And then there's the second flavour, the kind of weird metaphysical primitive that sticks a property and a particular together to give us a negative state of affairs. Suppose you think that states of affairs are metaphysically primitive things. Maybe Wittgenstein thought something like that in Tractatus. Probably not, but some analytic philosophers have interpreted Wittgenstein as having a metaphysical view, or at least they've extracted this view as a metaphysical view from the Tractatus, on which there are states of affairs, but they're metaphysically primitive. They're not made up of stuff, they just exist. They're unstructured. Not a lot you can say about them. I suppose that's the view. We just posit the existence of states of affairs. Well, if you're allowed to do that, then I can just posit a few more. I'm incurring a quantitative cost. I'm saying there's more of the same. But I'm not really incurring much of a qualitative cost. I'm saying there's more of the same. I'm not saying there's this completely different kind. So I think that's not every theory out there of states of affairs. But I think there's fairly good reasons for thinking that if you give me a theory of state affairs, of the regular everyday ones that we're happy with, we can tweak it a bit to make it account for negative states of affairs too. By the way, you might be worried that it's a bit of a step from the state of affairs that I'm not standing still right now to negative state of affairs to a state of affairs that there's no right out of the room. Seems to be a different kind of thing. Negative yet existential. States of affairs seem to be tricky. But you might think of a negative existential state of affairs as being something like a certain property lacking another certain property. The property of being a rhino in this room doesn't have the property of being instantiated. Something like that. OK, so how are we doing? Well, I started off with the, the basic theory. To be true is for a proposition to have a truth maker. There's reasons for going into this heavy duty metaphysical theory because the alternative, deflationism, has two big problems. 
There's reason for thinking the theory can get off the ground because there's reason for thinking that every truth has a truth maker. There's some reason for thinking that there's some reason to believe in things like negative states of affairs, and they're the kinds of things you're going to need if you think that every truth has a truth maker. I want to think now about some of the payoffs of this theory. We've kind of done a lot of metaphysically heavy duty stuff. We've, or at least I've got myself into a position where I think there are all these states of affairs in the world. They make true all of these kind of propositions. That gives us a theory of truth. Can't we get a bit more payoff from this quite large and scary ontology? So here's one payoff I think we might have. In philosophy of language, we talk an awful lot about propositions. Metaphysically, we want to know what they are. We want to know their identity conditions. We want to know what their constituents are. And we would like to connect this up to some things we believe about metaphysics. We'd like to know, for instance, what it is for one of these things to be true out of the world, true simpliciter, whatever. It's not always obvious how we can go from a philosophy of language theory of what a proposition is to a more metaphysical story of how these things get to be true or false. They don't always connect up very neatly. I kind of guess it'd be nice if the story of what propositions are and the story of what proposition, what it is to make a proposition true if those two things connected up neatly. <clears throat> so here's a neat way of doing it. Take a proposition to be a set of truth makers. That sounds kind of circular. If I said, take a proposition to be its set of truth makers, well, how do you know which things make it true until you've said what proposition is? But that's not quite what I said. What we want to do is take a proposition to be a set of states of affairs. If you like, those states of affairs could be all the possible ones as well as all the actual ones. That would be a kind of modal realist view of this metaphysics, but with states of affairs rather than David Lewis's possible worlds. Alternatively, we might have a view that says, here's the actual, real states of affairs. But then we'll add to that some kind of ersatz states of affairs, mere representations of states of affairs, set theoretic constructions or what have you. The kind of stuff people do with non-actual possible worlds, whatever that is, let's do that with non-actual states of affairs. You can go either way there, not fast. That gives us a whole bunch of states of affairs. Let's bundle them together in sets of various kinds. Those sets, or at least the ones satisfying certain conditions, they're the propositions. What's nice about this view? Well, one thing is it tells you really straight and simply what it is for a proposition to have a truth maker. It's just membership. X truth makes P if X is a member of P. Couldn't be simpler than that. That seems a bit easy. What else do you get out of this view? You get M many of the advantages of the sets of possible worlds theory of propositions. Okay? Lewis, Stormacher, they take propositions to be sets of possible worlds. That's a view that has lots of theoretical advantages. But it has lots of theoretical disadvantages. Take two equivalent propositions, turns out they're the same proposition. That feels a bit weird because it seems like me saying that either I exist or I don't and then saying some complicated theorem of maths, seems like I'm saying two different things, expressing two different propositions. Lewis says, no, nah, same proposition. But if propositions are sets of truth makers, then we can distinguish between necessarily equivalent propositions. We can go one better with this theory, actually, because although the one I just gave you, the theory I just gave you, propositions are sets of truth makers, sets, sets of states of affairs, allows us to distinguish between necessarily equivalent propositions. It won't allow us to distinguish between two propositions which are each necessarily false. They won't have any truth makers. They'll both be the empty set, they'll be the same. We can, we can get around this problem by thinking of double propositions. 
A double proposition is a pair. One set of states of affairs, another set of states of affairs. We think of the first set as the proposition's truth makers, and the second set as the proposition's policy makers. On this kind of more advanced view, a proposition consists in all the things that would make it true were they to exist, all the things that would make it false were they to exist. This way, we can distinguish between propositions which don't have any positive truth makers, mathematical falses. We can distinguish them. But we don't distinguish too far. Proposition A and B, proposition B and A, same proposition. What about a liar? We started off with a problem for deflationism. Deflationism has a real problem with the liar paradox. If we've got a metaphysical theory of propositions, what are we going to say about a liar? Well, seems like the obvious thing to say on this view is, or rather the thing that this view recommends saying is, there's no proposition. If there was a proposition, we would have to have possible truth makers or possible false makers. But in the case of the liar, there's no possible truth makers. There's no possible false makers. They just don't exist. So that proposition just doesn't exist. Okay, there's no liar proposition. Sounds a bit weird because there's a liar sentence and it looks like all the words that make up that sentence are meaningful and they're put together in a perfectly grammatical way. That's just one of those weird facts of meaning, of language, of semantics. You take some perfectly good words, put them together in a perfectly good way, sometimes no, no proposition comes out. Let's see if we can revenge it. Okay, so the liar doesn't express a proposition, so it's not true. But hang on, it says it's not true, so it is true. So that theory won't work. That's the revenge. But it doesn't work. We can't go from the liar expresses no proposition, so it's not true, oh, hang on, so it is true. If the liar doesn't express proposition, it doesn't express anything. It, so the step where we go, oh, but it says that it's not true, and you said it's not true, so problem. It doesn't say anything. There's no proposition expressed by the liar, so it doesn't say anything. How have we managed to get around the liar in a way that all this years of logical research hasn't managed to get around the liar? Well, I haven't given you a systematic logic for the liar. Logic, as we do it as a practice, deals with sentences, and I haven't given you an axiomatic theory or anything like it of when a sentence expresses a proposition. My guess is that's what we can't do. That's why we can't get a consistent, simple, almost classical logic of truth. The logic of propositions, as far as I see it, is perfectly classical. There's no threat of paradox because whenever there would be a threat of paradox, there's no proposition expressed. What we can't get is a theory that tells us when a string expresses a proposition. Because any such theory, it would be pretty easy to generate paradox. We've got a metaphysical theory of propositions. We don't have an axiomatic uh, theory that tells us when a proposition is expressed. Okay. So there's some costs with that, but I think that's probably the best we can do. Okay, so that's the theory. Property of truth is the property of having a truth maker. There's some reason to think that it's got some benefits over the alternative, the deflationist view. There's some reason to think the metaphysical demands it makes that everything has a truth maker can be met. There's some reason to think that the kinds of entities it requires have some kind of intuitive arguments behind them. And there's some payoffs. We can do some nice things in semantics. We can do some nice things in philosophy of language. So that's the theory. Thanks very much. <laughs>